So I'm an ear, nose, throat surgeon and uh, an innovator. So I'm one of these growing category of people called doc entrepreneurs. In my specific case, doc e entrepreneur, because of the capital E and T. Um, uh, I thought today I should walk you through a perspective of, of what it's like to invent in India. Because India is kind of a representative market to a lot of developing countries. And, uh, and also give you an overview of the healthcare ecosystem there through my journey. How do I do this? There are three components to the Indian healthcare ecosystem. The first one is a mutated human species called the Indian patient. Now, I personally would define an Indian patient as one who has an illness that requires a very, you know, a cure almost immediately, but they think they're doctors. <laughs> right? Whereas an Indian doctor is someone whom I would define as someone who knows how to treat the Indian patient, but thinks they are God. <laughs> now you put both of them with resource constraint settings and give them freedom to do whatever they want, that's the Indian healthcare ecosystem. <laughs> so for the last 10 years um, since I've been practicing medicine as an ENT surgeon, um, I remember the day when I was to see my first patient. Right after med school, you know, you're very excited. Uh, any doctors here? Okay, so I'll, I'll help you understand what I was going through. <laughs> the first patient, I was wondering, what would that first patient be like? Would it be a man? Would it be a woman? Would it be an old person? Would it be a child? What symptom would they come to me with? How I would take their history and figure out in my mind, like Sherlock Holmes, what the possible diagnosis could be? <laughs> and I would confirm that by eliciting the signs and symptoms. I would give them the right amount of investigations to double check, just to be sure. And then treat them with the right amount of medications and tender love and care. I was sneaked in to the back entrance of a 500-bedded general hospital in a rural part of the country, India. And there was a very terrified and anxious looking compounder or attendant greeting me. His only concern was, did I have breakfast? I could see a door on the other end of the room, which was kind of holding something really strong and powerful. I didn't know what it was. He just says, doctor, are you ready? I said, yes. He unlatches the door. And I kid you not, there were over 100 people in the room just flew in a black swarm of an ocean. And they're all talking at the same time. They all have slips in their hand. And they're all telling their symptoms. And they want me to treat them together at the same time. <laughs> if I would hear fever, I would give them a paracetamol. If I would hear pain, I would give them a painkiller. If I didn't know what it was, I would send them for a test till I figured out what was happening. This is a very, very common scenario in India. There is one doctor for 1,700 patients. World Health Organization recommends one doctor for 1,000 patients. It doesn't sound this bad, but it does become bad when 90% of your doctors are concentrated only in the three or four large cities of the country. And the rural areas don't have these doctors, but they have lots of patients because a country like India, 80% of the population is in villages. And this proportion gets skewed exponentially to leave a situation like this. It gets worse. Especially when I went on to do um, higher education in ENT, in, in addition to seeing hundreds of patients, I get to do surgical rounds, operate on patients, post-op rounds, conduct CMEs, organize uh, events, ward rounds, night duties. Night duties so long that I would go clean shave and come back with a beard. And there would be rural duties where we would go to rural places and, you know, I, I remember I once went with a senior doctor, and there was this patient who came with laryngitis, with sore throat. They kind of talk like this, right? And you know how the seniors always have a tendency to kind of test your knowledge and rag you a bit, right? I was, you know, when, when somebody has a throat lesion in many parts of India, especially the ENT community, still uses a, a mirror and a headlamp. And they kind of open the patient's mouth, put that mirror inside, and look at the reflection of the mirror to see what the vocal cords look like. So this senior of mine calls me and says, Jagdish, come here. Tell me the findings of this patient. I performed the mirror examination. I couldn't make out anything. 
the mouth is fogging, small mirror. I, I didn't know what to do. But I, could say, I couldn't say that I don't know what the finding is, so I said the most common thing one would say. I said, it's normal. <laughs> he said, great, because I couldn't make out anything myself. And then I got worried. I was like, no, no, we need to treat this guy. I thought you knew what you were doing. <laughs> I'm junior. I can be pardoned. And we had to tr figure out what his problem was just by his symptoms and treat him by guesswork. But when I go back to my hospital, which is a tertiary, you know, 2,000 bedded hospital, we have this huge, lovely Olympus endoscopy system, which has a camera and a light source. You can put a camera inside. You can see the vocal cords, you know, in three-dimensional images. You can pick out the smallest of lesions. And it didn't make sense to me that why at a place where you don't get these patients who need this early detection, you have this high-end system, and a place where you want this high-end system, you have mirrors. So what do you do? So I went to my boss, a very angry boss. Everyone has an angry boss, Dr. Ravi Nair. And I went to him, and I told him, sir, why don't we make something that can visualize the vocal cords better in rural areas? He responds by saying, Jagdish, are you a barking dog or a biting dog? <laughs> I didn't quite prepare for that answer, but I was thinking. I knew barking is not good. So I said, sir, I'm a biting dog. So he says, why are you barking? <laughs> you are barking to me. This is barking. Everyone's barking. He's irritated because everyone's just complaining, right? Nobody's doing anything. He's like, you are barking. Do this, do that. Everyone's saying, why can't we make this? Why can't we make that? Just go and do it if you want to. Right? Act small. <laughs> Just do it. Thank you. <laughs> but I was like, how do I do it? Your salary is $200 <laughs> a month. And what, I, what can I do? He's like, no, do it. If, if you have an idea, go do something about it. So I was like, what do I do? So at that point of time, six years back, we didn't have smartphones, especially in India. We were still a little behind. We used to get cameras, digital cameras. I, I was thinking, why can't we take a digital camera figure out a way for it to attach to an endoscope, and have that camera show this image. And it worked. It worked. I spent about, about $1,000, $1,500 by borrowing money from my parents. <laughs> and, I, and I figured out um, a mechanical engineer who could connect a standard endoscope to a camera. And I was amazed that the image that came on the camera was as good, or at least as adequate, to diagnose laryngeal or throat cancer lesions. And then I went back to my boss and I said, look, biting, I've made something. <laughs> so he says, look, now, now I'm going to tell you something very serious. If you wouldn't have made this, I would have forgiven you. But now you've made this and you don't take this all the way to the patient, I'm never going to forgive you. And I'm like, he's my thesis guide. I'm not going to clear my ENT <laughs> this way, right? So I was like, what do I do? He's like, form a company, form a startup company. So I go back home, I have a wife. I said, you're my partner in life. <laughs> Would you like to be a co-founder of the startup company? <laughs> she says, no. <laughs> so I go to the next best option, her sister. <laughs> and we formed a company. <laughs> and we basically really struggle. Both of us were part-time. I'm a doctor. I'm studying. She is an engineer. She was studying. And nobody would invest in a part-time person. Nobody would invest. We struggled really hard. We couldn't get it beyond a point. We had a design firm. We had an engineering firm. We couldn't really sustain for a long time. And Dr. my boss, Dr. Ravina, said, look, I don't think this is going to go too far. Maybe you have to learn how to invent first. Go find out. There must be a program that teaches you how to invent. And then I applied, and there was this government-run program called Stanford India Biodesign, which would take one doctor every year from India and send them to Stanford University to learn the process of invention by coupling them with engineers and designers. So I got into that. But I really felt that this product should not be lying in my desk. Has anyone seen Godfather? So I called the design firm and made an offer they cannot refuse. <laughs> I basically offered them to buy my technology because they were developing it for a very small royalty, and they took it forward. And that way, I at least felt that by the time I go to Stanford, something will happen with the product, and you know, it'll move. So I went to Stanford University. I learned two things. The first aha moment was 90% of the doctors who were inventing devices there were Indian. They even studied it at India. And I was wondering, you know, we're not too different, you and I. 
how come you're inventing here and I'm not inventing there? And they gave me the second aha moment. They said, you know, Jagdish, if we have an idea and we go to the cafeteria, I can talk to a lawyer, I can talk to a mechanical engineer, I can talk to a designer, I can talk to, a, I can talk to anyone there and we can connect and form a company or take this forward. And the institution has a format that if you invent, there is a way you can buy your license back and take this forward. And it's well accepted here. Not so much in India. I don't know how it is here as well. Right? So with this, I came to know that the most important thing to invent is actually first a team. Is a cross-disciplinary team first that together identifies the problem, that together understands the problem, that together invents, and then together takes it forward because they have the passion to do it. Rather than what I was doing back home, where I had an idea and started getting people who always wanted to work on a contract basis, which requires money. So when I learned this and I came back, um, I had a team that we developed a low-cost liver biopsy device and some other devices, but what I did is I recreated the need or the device for the ENT endoscopy device. And I realized that I was making something for doctors in rural areas, but we don't have doctors in rural areas. We have health workers in rural areas who are housewives. So I had to re-engineer the device to make it suit their skill, and then Medtronic bought over the technology. And uh, now at least, I think the latest that I've heard is over 200,000 patients have been screened for ENT diseases using the device. And, and you know, with this learning, that's how I could move it forward. I ran this program for the government of India and followed the principle of creating a team first, having them spend two to three months in the hospital just understanding problems, documenting things that go wrong, figuring out what's missing, and then creating a solution and then taking it forward. And it worked. Two of these uh, products just got licensed out to a larger company in a matter of nine months. It's unheard of. Then I came back to Bangalore and formed one of this, com this company called Inaxel, where we follow this principle of biodesign. We create a team first, send them to the hospital, and again, follow that process. We have a portfolio of ENT products, we have a portfolio of critical care products, and we have a portfolio of maternal and child health products that follow the same uh, principle. So I started, because, you know, in India, there was just one doctor trained every year. There was a lack of doctors who knew this process. So I went on to teach a lot of doctors how to invent. And one day, Dr. Ravi Nair, my boss, invites me to speak at his hospital. He was the dean of a cancer hospital. And I give a talk to about, I don't know, 50 doctors. I get a standing ovation at the end of it. Because they didn't know this information of how they can develop technologies by working with teams. I was waiting for a nice pat on my back from Dr. Ravi Nair. You know what he said? He said, you're still barking. I was like, what? Look at the number of devices I'm developing. I've got teams and I'm not barking. It's like you're barking about it. <laughs> All I could hear you do is bark. How many places can you bark? How many hospitals are you going to go and bark? How many doctors are you going to bark? So I'm like, what should I do? It's like, write it in a book. So I did. <laughs> I wrote it in a book because, you know, I didn't want to be the barking dog and biting dog. And probably if you look under your chairs, you might find a copy of this book, if you're lucky. <laughs> it's for you. And uh, maybe I could just hand a couple of books to ones who are laughing the most. <laughs> I'll give it to you. OK. I'll give you one. And maybe I'll give you one. Thank you. Right. Great. So <laughs> I wrote this book so that more doctors and engineers and designers could, could understand the process. This book is not full of successes. It's full of failures. It's full of challenges. But that's what nobody knows. This has information like how much a lawyer would charge you so that he doesn't fleece you when you're going there. You know? How much an engineering would charge? How much a licensing term uh, agreement is? You know, so that's uh, when I wrote this book, and then that's it for me, guys. Thank you very much. You can follow me on uh, Twitter. Uh, great. Thank you for having me here. Um, if you're not guessed, I'm also a stand-up comedian. I have a YouTube channel. <laughs> Please do like, share, and subscribe. <laughs> you know, that's what I learned. You have to market yourself. You have to sell yourself, right? Um, open to any questions uh, later over coffee, but thank you very much for being a lovely audience. Thank you.